Welcome back to the Lab Rat Lab. Now in this episode, I want to talk about parachutes. Now, as usual, I'm going to talk about some physics, I'll do some mathematical calculations, and I'll do a couple experiments to help us understand what's going on. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. A parachute is a flexible device whose primary purpose is to produce drag. Now modern parafoils also generate lift, and that results in smaller canopies and the ability to maneuver. However, in this video, we're going to focus on non-lifting parachutes. Now, the thin canopy material and the slender suspension lines allow a big device to be packed into a very small volume. An example, here's a 63-foot cross parachute, and you can see the relative size of the parachute pack at the bottom of the image. Now, the purpose of the parachute is to create a large drag area, which in turn creates a large drag. Here's Larry the Lab Rat, and he represents a certain drag area prior to parachute opening. He deploys his parachute, the drag area becomes much larger, creating a much larger drag. The recovery system usually involves more than one parachute. Now this image represents a sounding rocket recovery system. Here is the cylindrical sounding rocket payload. And the first thing to deploy is the drogue parachute. Now a drogue is designed to be strong so it can withstand the high velocities and heavy loads of initial deployment. The drogue provides some initial drag and also stabilizes the system so the main parachute can come out cleanly. Now, the drogue parachute is attached to the main parachute bag with a long tow line. Inside this bag is the main canopy. And after approximately 10 to 15 seconds, a line is cut along the drogue to pull the main parachute bag out of the payload. And as it does, the main canopy deploys. Now, the main canopy is designed to provide the full deceleration of the payload and provide the soft landing of the system when it hits the water or the ground. So what keeps the flexible parachute canopy open? Well, here's a diagram showing the canopy, the suspension lines that attach the canopy to the suspended body. Now the suspended body has weight and that weight is transferred to the suspension lines, which ultimately transfer the loads to the canopy. Now there are vertical force components and horizontal force components, and those forces tend to pull the canopy closed. Now that's certainly not a good thing to see if you're a skydiver. Now as the parachute moves through the atmosphere, it scoops up a bubble of pressurized air. Now that air pressure is known as the internal pressure or dynamic pressure, and that's one half air density times velocity squared. And it's this internal pressure force that pushes the canopy open and keeps it open during descent. Let's take a quick look at that equation for dynamic pressure and perform a unit analysis to see if indeed it comes out to be units of pressure. Here's the equation. Pressure is equal to one half times density times velocity squared. Now one half has no units, so we'll eliminate that. So pressure from a unit perspective is kilograms divided by meters cubed times meters squared over seconds squared. Now, some of these meters can cancel out, so pressure becomes kilograms divided by meters times seconds squared. Now, recall that a kilogram is a newton divided by acceleration of gravity. And performing some algebra, we can see that kilogram is a newton times seconds squared divided by meters. So if I substitute that into the pressure equation, I get this. I get some uh, units to cancel out, and ultimately I end up with pressure as newtons per meter squared. And that is indeed the units for pressure. Now let's take a look and see how Newton's second law of motion comes into play with parachutes. Now, drag and weight act on a body as it falls through the atmosphere. When the parachute is deployed, it creates more drag area and thus more drag. And according to Newton's second law of motion, the addition of more drag, which is an adverse force, results in a lower acceleration. And you can see that here in the equation F equals MA. Now, whether the body actually decelerates or not depends on the velocity and altitude, and thus the drag, when the chute is deployed. Now, if the body has a high velocity at parachute deployment, the drag may be greater than the weight. And in that case, the body will have a negative acceleration or a deceleration, and the system will slow down. However, if the body has a low velocity at parachute deployment, the drag may be less than the weight. And in that case, the body will continue to accelerate or speed up but not at the same magnitude. In either case, the velocity will change. It'll either increase or decrease. And as the velocity changes, so does the drag. 
Eventually, the system will reach an equilibrium point where the drag equals the weight. So why does the system move towards this equilibrium point? Well, we can understand this by looking at the drag equation, where drag is equal to one half times air density times velocity squared times the drag coefficient of the parachute times the area of the parachute. And notice that that first set of terms, one half air density times velocity squared is the dynamic pressure. Now, if a drag starts off lower than the weight, the acceleration will be positive. This means the velocity will increase. And increasing velocity means increasing drag. Eventually, the drag will increase to a point where it will be equal to the weight, and the acceleration will become zero, or weight minus drag equals zero. Now, if a drag starts off higher than the weight, the acceleration will be negative, and the system will slow down. Decreasing velocity means decreasing drag. Eventually, the drag will decrease to a point where it equals the weight, and acceleration will become zero. Now, when drag is equal to weight, the composite force, or the numerator in the acceleration equation, becomes zero, which makes the overall acceleration zero. An acceleration of zero means the velocity is not changing. When the velocity stops changing, the descending system will reach terminal velocity. When the system has reached terminal velocity, it will descend at a constant velocity until it hits the ground. Now let's use this concept of terminal velocity to design a parachute. Once again, here's our drag equation. Drag is equal to one half air density times velocity squared times the drag coefficient times area. Now recall for terminal velocity, drag is equal to weight. We've reached that equilibrium point. Now when at terminal velocity, the drag equation can then be expressed as follow. Weight is equal to one half air density velocity squared times CD times area. Now weight is gonna be fixed. We know what the system is. Of course, one half is a number and that's fixed. You can assume air density is fixed because you want to calculate the velocity of the parachute when it hits the ground. The drag coefficient will be fixed once we select the parachute type. And we know the velocity of the system, we want to keep that low. So what's left is we have to calculate the area to give us our desired impact velocity. Now by applying some algebra, we can get a more useful version of the drag equation. And that's area is equal to two times the weight of the system divided by the air density, the velocity squared, and the drag coefficient. Well, the system weight is known, and we assume a standard air density at the impact altitude, in this case, the ground. The drag coefficient depends on the type of chute selected, and the designer selects desired impact velocity, and we use those values to calculate the required area of the parachute. Now let's take a look at the parachute design process. First thing we need to do is determine the suspended weight of the rocket, the capsule, or maybe even a skydiver, for example. We then select the desired shape for the canopy, and that shape drives the theoretical drag coefficient. We then need to determine the desired impact velocity. Now, if that velocity is too fast, it can result in a broken skydiver, or if it's too slow, it could result in too much wind drift, which would blow our skydiver off course. A good starting point might be six to seven meters per second. Then we calculate the canopy area that is required to give the desired theoretical impact velocity. This is also known as the terminal velocity. Now there are several simple parachute types. First, there's a cross parachute, a simple square parachute, and a flat circular parachute. Now the typical drag coefficients for full scale parachutes are as follows. Flat circular is about 0.78. Square is about 0.73 and across is 0.7. Now these are the drag coefficients that are typically used when designing full-scale parachute systems. These are not the values obtained when small-scale drop tests are conducted. Let's take a look at an example design problem. For this problem, we want to determine the canopy area needed for a flat circular parachute that will allow a 44,500 newton elephant to land on the ground at five meters per second. Now, for a flat circular parachute, the CD is 0.78. And we can assume that the elephant will be landing on a spot that is at sea level. And as such, we can assume that the air density is 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. Now, here's the area equation that we'll be using. We insert our values in for the variables. And we see that the required area is 3,725 square meters. And that translates into a parachute that has a diameter of 34.4 meters. 
So that's a pretty large parachute. Now they have some good, strong background information. Let's see if we can use that new knowledge to see if we can calculate the drag coefficients of some small test parachutes. Small parachute models can be tested by conducting simple drop tests. All that is needed is a wind-free area to drop the parachutes and a stopwatch to measure descent time. Now the drop height will depend on the size of the parachutes. Small chutes, about the size of a facial tissue, can be tested in an eight foot tall room. Now for a tissue paper or model rocket sized parachute, the parachute should be allowed to fall for about 0.3 meters before starting the stopwatch. This allows a terminal velocity of the system to be achieved. You see a diagram showing this drop test at the right. Now the testing process involves number one, measuring the canopy area. Number two, measuring the system weight. Now this will be the assumed system drag assuming that the system falls at terminal velocity during a test. I'd like to caution you, too much suspended weight may prevent terminal velocity from actually being achieved. Step number three is to conduct the drop tests. Make five to 10 drops for each configuration and record the fall times. Fourth, we then calculate the average fall times and the associated descent velocities. Then we calculate the drag coefficients, then tabulate the results and assess what's going on. Here are the three canopies that were tested. They were all made out of lightweight tissue paper and they all had the same reference area of 0.05 meters squared. Now, three suspended weights were used for each parachute test. Now, if we assume the chutes are terminal velocity during the descent, which they were, the weights then represent the drag of the systems at three different velocities. And if we recall, heavier weight equals faster fall velocity. Now the canopy weight for each parachute was 0.21 newtons, and we see the three suspended weights that were used for the testing. Now here's my simple drop test apparatus. I've got a wooden rig here, and supporting a string at the top, and down at the bottom, the string's attached to a block of wood, and that block of wood provides tension in the string to keep it taut. My parachute canopies have a hole punched at the apex, and that allows the parachute to move down the guideline with very little friction and it keeps it from drifting off one side or the other, so my motion sensor gets really good data. All I gotta do is uh, drop the parachute and let my motion sensor measure the velocity. Three, two, one, zero. Now, with lightweight parachutes, I can simply use a stopwatch to measure that fall time and use the distance to calculate the average velocity. And my experimentation shows that that works out pretty well. Here's the motion sensor. It measures the position of the parachute as it falls, and then it calculates the velocity and associated acceleration. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some drop tests. This will be trial number one. This is my flat circular parachute with the lightest suspended load. Three, two, one, drop. Now, let's do some more runs to make sure we get good, useful engineering data. That's two. Three, two, one, drop. Test three. Three, two, one, drop. Test four, drop. Test five, drop. Here's some representative data from one of the parachute drop tests. Now this data was collected using an ultrasonic motion sensor. The blue line represents the position of the parachute. It started off at roughly two meters in altitude and over time it descended to the floor. The purple line represents the velocity. We see that the parachute system accelerates for a certain period of time, actually a very short period of time, but then it achieves a constant velocity, which is the terminal velocity of the system. Now, of course, made multiple tests for each parachute system. And here's a sample of multiple tests overlaid one another. I took the average velocity at each of these points to calculate the average terminal velocity of the system during a test. And that came out to be 1.17 meters per second. Now, looking at data, we could also determine the fall distance required to reach terminal velocity. And that was roughly 0.3 meters. You don't need an electronic motion detector to conduct these tests. You can use a simple stopwatch. Here I repeated one of the tests using a stopwatch to measure the drop time of the parachute. I made eight trials, and here are the drop times I measured, and the average came out to be 0.99 seconds. I calculated the fall distance of 1.2 meters. I used those values in the velocity equation, fall distance divided by fall time, and came up with an average fall velocity of 1.2 meters per second. Now that came out quite close to the uh, 1.17 meters per second that was measured by the motion sensor. 
This tells me that a stopwatch can give good results for this sort of test. Here's how we calculate the drag coefficient from the experimental test data. Recall that drag is equal to 1 half times atmospheric density times velocity squared times drag coefficient times area. If we apply a little bit of algebra, we can solve for CD, the drag coefficient. And CD is equal to 2 times weight divided by atmospheric density times velocity squared times area. Now to make sure this value comes out as a unitless number, we can do a quick unit analysis. We see that all the meters cancel out, the kilograms cancel out, and so do the second squares. So indeed, CD is a unitless number. Here's some sample data tables that can be used during this testing. In this table, we're measuring the descent times and calculating the average velocities. And here, we're using this to calculate the drag coefficient during the tests. After all drop tests were completed and calculations made, here's the drag coefficients I determined from my experimental tests. And you see the three terminal velocities that were used, and you see the resulting drag coefficients for each of those velocities. I took that data and calculated the average drag coefficient for the parachute shapes. That came out with a flat circular with a drag coefficient of 1.3. The square parachute also had a drag coefficient of 1.3. The cross parachute had the smallest CD, and that was 1.1. Now, these values are about double those of the full-scale parachute systems. So let's take a look and see if we can figure out what's going on. Why does the CD seem to vary with the terminal velocity? Recall that three different suspended loads were used to give three different terminal velocities. The data shows a 10 to 20% variation in the calculated drag coefficients. Is it possible the suspended load could affect the shape of the canopy and thus resulting drag and drag coefficient? Well, here's some images of the square canopy, one with a lightly loaded case and one with a heavily loaded case. Notice the shapes of the canopies aren't that drastically different. There's probably minimal effect on the drag and drag coefficient. If you look at a data plot, you'll notice that the data is inconsistent. Sometimes the CD is up and sometimes down, depending on the terminal velocity. This tells me that the effect could be air currents in the room or drag of the canopy moving along the guideline. So why is a flat circular parachute CD larger than the cross parachute CD? Well, the drag, and thus a drag coefficient, is actually dependent on how much frontal area is presented to the airflow. The larger the frontal area, the larger the drag. Now, this frontal area is not the same thing as the reference area used in calculating the drag coefficient. In these images, I'm comparing the flat circular parachute to the cross parachute under identical loading conditions. The blue oval represents the frontal area of the flat circular parachute on the left, and I've superimposed that over the same scale image of the cross parachute. You notice that the frontal area of the cross parachute, represented by the green oval, is less than that of the flat circular. This means less drag will be produced by the cross parachute and thus a smaller CD will be calculated. Also notice how the panels on the cross parachute are more vertical and they're not really contributing to the drag of the parachute. So why don't the CDs from the model tests match full-scale parachute CDs? Well, when testing subscale models, maintaining dimensional equivalency is not the only important consideration. The relationship between inertial and viscous forces must also be considered. And this is done via the Reynolds number. Now, the Reynolds number is equal to air density times velocity times the characteristic length, which could be the diameter of the canopy, for example, divided by the dynamic viscosity of air. Now, for wind tunnel testing and drop testing results to be scaled up to full-scale objects, the test models must be tested at Reynolds numbers that are equivalent to that of the full-scale object. Now, since models are smaller and thus have a smaller characteristic length, they must be tested at higher velocities or higher densities to achieve the needed equivalency. As for the testing outlined in this lesson, the test velocities have to be significantly higher to achieve equivalency with full-scale parachutes, and the small tissue paper chutes would be torn to shreds. Now, as the generic test data at the right shows, the drag coefficient decreases as the Reynolds number increases. So this means that if the test parachutes were somehow tested at higher velocities, the resulting drag coefficients would tend towards those of the full-scale parachutes. Well, hopefully I've given you some interesting insights on how parachutes work and how to test them to be able to determine their drag coefficients. And I encourage you to try your own experiments to see if you can get similar results. Well, that'll do it for this episode. I hope to see you next time here at Labrat Scientific.